This is the Guns Magazine podcast, episode number 39. Hi there, and welcome to another episode of the Guns Magazine podcast. I'm your host and the editor of Guns Magazine, Brent Wheat. Thanks for joining us as we talk to the interesting people who make up the world of shooting, hunting, and the firearms industry. Before we get started, let's talk about our sponsor, Kimber Firearms. Kimber was founded with the singular purpose of making every firearm the best it can possibly be, with a fit and finish that only practiced hands can achieve and appreciate. Whether you carry a Kimber for personal protection, hunting, or competition, know that their promise of quality without compromise is how they measure success. To learn more about Kimber Firearms, visit KimberAmerica.com. Well, today's episode is an interesting mix. I'm talking with Lou Gosnell, a veteran range master at Gunsight Academy in Paulden, Arizona. Lou has had an incredibly interesting career, ranging from being a police officer in L.A., a personal security operative, a winning competitive shooter, and firearms instructor. Lou won the very first single action shooting society end of trail competition and is a nationally known cowboy action shooter. At Gunsight, he teaches most of the classes involving single action revolvers and lever guns. He also teaches the church defense class, and we discuss a wide range of considerations for those thinking and operating on a church security team. Now here's my wide-ranging talk with Lou Gosnell. Well, hey, Lou. Thanks for joining us here on the Guns Magazine podcast. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, I've trained under you, Lou. I was very impressed by the uh, not only the passion to teaching, but obviously your skill set. So you've got a pretty interesting backstory. Explain real uh, in the somewhat short version of how we came to be sitting here in the conference room of Gunsight Academy. Well, I was very fortunate uh, to be working for a police department that was forward thinking and uh, had some trainers there and the administration staff and firearms training staff that had been to Gunsight in the late 70s, early 80s and carried that forward doctrine going uh when I joined the police force, uh, my agency in 2000, I hadn't been to Gunsight yet, I, but I had read Colonel Cooper's writings going back to when I was a boy. Sure. And it was a great influence on me. And one of the reasons I joined the Marine Corps was because of the way he sold it. Uh, and he wasn't too far off on the outcome. Uh, I came here to Gunsight in 2003, took uh, my first pistol class of uh, 350 and took 223 carbine and uh did very well with those. And uh, my eyes were open, like, wait a minute, I've done a lot of shooting my whole life from the age of nine years old with my Red Rider <laughs> going and, you know, shot competition, had some successes. And I thought I knew a lot about things with firearms. Nope. I had just been lucky surviving in uh, East LA working police work uh, up until that point. And I was really, it was a, it was a good, good heads up. Yeah. I mean here. Well, and your background is so much more varied than that. We were just talking. You you did uh, protective uh, details, uh, private security, and did the Learjet thing. And <laughs> yep. But those kind of folks, you you weren't that impressed with. Well, everybody has their own story, and uh, sometimes a lot of money will buy you a lot of problems. Right. And uh, very often, if you read the tabloids, uh, they don't have to make that up. Everything in there, in the <laughs> Inquirer or any place else, that's probably one hundred percent true. Yeah. Yeah. Another reason that uh, you've had such an interesting uh, background, you're a big time uh, cowboy action shooter. You also instruct here at Gunsight on uh, lever guns and single actions, and, and that's uh, real popular with our audience. Tell me a little bit about your background in that, because I believe you won the, the first end of the trail. I was fortunate, but uh, part of my background is I've, I've always been lucky. So <laughs> uh, I hope I haven't burned it up so far, but... Uh, in 1982, I was uh, a young sergeant in the Marine Corps stationed at Camp Pendleton, and I fell in with a group of people that started the cowboy action game, mm -hmm. a single action shooting society. Harper Cray, uh, Bill Hahn, Gordon Davis of Gordon Davis Leather fame, mm -hmm. and uh, others, that core group. Uh, and I was just a guy on the edge. You know, I hung out with those guys. I shot in the Oceanside Pistol League with them. Uh, I had, you know, meals with Bill Hahn at his home in Oceanside and conversations with those people fascinated me. Uh, I was a pretty skilled Marine shooter. Uh, I, I was good with an M16 and a 1911 pistol, uh, but these cowboy guns, hmm, a little, <laughs> they were a little trickier. There's a lot yeah. going on with them. Uh, 
but shooting them, practicing with those those people. Uh, when they had the first end of trail at Coda de Casa in Southern California, uh, at the end of two days of shooting, I won. <laughs> and the, the reasons for that, you know, are, are basically uh, mathematical. Uh, I shot a rifle better than everybody else. And, ah. and that particular, they got smarter about it later on. Yeah. Rifle was weighted 50%, pistol 25%, shotgun 25%. Mm-hmm. And I carried the rifle and then finished second or third and the other two things. And that wow. was that. So what was your lever gun? Uh, trusted Marlin 1894 and 357 Magnum. Ah. Factory, as factory as you could see it. No kidding. Except, you know, that was pre-lawyer, so no cross-bolt safety. <laughs> the, uh, that gun with 125 grain Federal Magnums. Uh, rang the steel out to 175 yards. Yeah. And I was the only one to do it. So, oh, wow. Again, lucky. <laughs> uh, sometimes it's better to be lucky than to be good. I'll take both, but <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, you've also done a lot of uh, a competitive shooting around the country. Uh, you were telling me you have a pretty low number in, what is it, USPA? Uh, that's right. I have a low IQ and I have a low <laughs> number in USPSA. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah. <laughs> so, the USPSA number, I'm, I'm lucky. It's uh, L5 hundred something. Uh, and then uh, that was uh, when they when they kicked off. And the, I don't know what the numbers are now in the hundreds of thousands, but uh, I shot uh, Soldier of Fortune when uh, Robert Brown from Soldier of Fortune magazine was putting that competition on. That was uh, considered, you know, the three gun event yeah. prior to USPSA picking up the mantle. And uh, as popular as three gun is now, that's where it started yeah. with him. And uh, one Soldier Fortune match uh, in 89, did a lot of steel challenge shooting, uh, shot with the greats, Rob Latham, Jerry Michalik, uh, Jerry Barnhart, Michael Plaxco, and uh, been destroyed by all of them. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, humility is one of those things that, you know, makes you a better person, I right. think. Uh, if you know how good you could be. That, you know, it's something to aspire to. Yeah. And having been around those guys, uh, it can be very, very humbling. <laughs> yes, it can. Yes. Um, what is it about the lever gun that really strikes a chord with you so much? Well, it, it, it strikes a chord with uh, a lot of Americana. The, 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 the gun is itself an American invention. Mm -hmm. uh, the Volcanic Firearms Company that started the lever tubular magazine project and then the Henry rifle, and then the Winchester rifle, and then everybody else after that. And there is more than you think. It's not just Winchester, Marlin, and them. Uh, the When you look at it with uh, a cowboy or a plainsman or uh, somebody on a covered wagon going across the plains thinking, you know, I'm going to risk everything and come stake out my little piece of the ground and be an American from Poland or Lithuania or you name it. And that's how that's how you see it. Yeah. Uh, plus, it's a darn handy rifle. Yeah. You know, nobody nobody says, hey, you know, that 150 grain bullet at 2,100 feet per second. Yeah. That's unimpressive. <laughs> okay. Why don't you just stand here then? Yeah. And wait for it. Well, you know, I, I've told... Uh made the point a lot of times my quote unquote truck gun is an old model 97 uh for a couple of reasons uh first of which it's very effective uh second of all uh i worry about theft you know going places where i park my vehicles that you know i worry if somebody break in i'd rather lose the 200 dollar lever gun than my 1500 dollars you know black rifle but the other side of it is especially in today's climate you can uh, have the gun in your hand and people don't get their their undergarments in a bunch because it's a cowboy gun you know it, right. it's not effective it's it's an old fashioned thing but but what those kind of people don't realize it's exceptionally effective and you know that's uh, like i said when i was here uh, training under you before that was really driven home you can do some really solid work with a lever gun very solid work it's fast yeah you know uh talk about uh, first Taking an empty gun that is chamber empty, magazine loaded, and going from that condition or patrol ready, like patrol car ready, uh, like you would with a shotgun, chamber empty, magazine loaded, saying, okay, gun in hand, we're going to shoot that target right over there. And you can do it in usually about two seconds. Yeah. Uh, if, you say, if you say, I'm going to take an unloaded semi-automatic fill in the blank, it, it takes a little more manipulation, a little more training, because uh, there's more things to flip around and turn off and uh, load up with. Uh, 
and it's just not as it's not done as slender. I mean, a lever action rifle, Marlin, Winchester, older, newer, doesn't really matter. Is kind of a, a sexy design anyway. Yeah, you know, you've seen it uh, in a thousand Western movies, and when you look at it, he's like, oh yeah, that's it's our rifle. The Winchester ninety four started off weighing six and a half pounds. Now, even though the planet has gotten heavier, the rifles are still six and a half pounds. Yeah, and same thing with Marlins. Uh, they're just a little bit over an inch wide, so you can carry them in your hand. Uh, Colonel Cooper, when he was writing about them, and talked about uh, a police rifle and how he, he believed a 30-30, 18-inch barreled gun with some good sights on it, aperture sights, and uh, a stock that would you know be a little bit shorter so it could fit uh, a greater range of people would be a much better rifle than a 22 caliber black rifle. Yeah. Okay, so the natural follow-on question here would be, so what gun does Luke Gosnell carry? Uh, well, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, a stock Winchester 94 with a 20-inch barrel doesn't need anything. Yeah. Uh, it'll run out to 150-plus yards with the iron sights on it if you can see them. I'm in my sixth decade, and I'm looking at the problem with, uh, you know, those open buckhorn sights are not as helpful as they used to be. Yeah. Uh, targets inside of 50 yards all, all day long. Exactly. Uh, I have a nice set of uh, Ashley Express sights on my personal 94. That's a little cut up, 17-inch barrel, uh, Cerakote paint on the outside, uh, shortened stock, handy gun. The action triggers a little bit lighter maybe than you get it from a factory lawyer setup. Yeah. Uh, all the sharp edges uh, rounded off. Yeah, it's a, it's a slick gun. We've talked about uh, lever actions. The natural accompaniment is the single action. And and it is a bit of an anachronism, especially in the self-defense world. But, uh, you know, uh, there's still folks, a lot of folks that come through gun sight, you know, mm-hmm. that are carrying single actions. Where do you see uh, the single action in today's world? Well, you, you, you touched on it uh, a few minutes ago when you talked about uh, politically acceptable firearms. Yeah. People look at that gun and they go, oh, yeah. cowboy gun. Exactly. And, you know, they get a little warm and fuzzy about it. But let's say a forty five Colt with a 250 grain bullet at 800 feet per second, uh, that'll punch through cows. Yeah. Which is why they built it in the first place. Yep. Uh, the cavalry wanted a gun that would kill horses out on the plains. And that's what the enemy was riding. Mm-hmm. And that's also what the inf- the cavalry was riding. And if a horse got away from somebody, they wanted to be able to pop that horse to save the soldier. Yeah. <sighs> that's a long sentence, kind of <laughs> clumsy. Uh, but that's a 150-year-old cartridge almost. Yeah. And it's still doing the work. And we get them out here, and we modify our courses of fire from what we would normally do with a semi-automatic pistol. They're modified slightly to allow for the math of a gun that only holds five or six shots. Mm-hmm. But those five or six shots at gun sight are demanded to be fired in an accurate fashion and in a very timely fashion. Yeah. And then we teach you how to reload that gun faster than you ever thought to reload it before. And that's the area that I'm looking forward to this week. We're going to be doing some single action work. And uh, I got to say, of the entire range of weapon systems, that's the one I've just not done a lot with. So um, I know maybe some folks think that that's heresy, but <laughs> yeah. I am, I'm looking forward to it. Now, you know, a uh, common thing that uh, the, the Cowboys, the Frontiers people, did I just say that? Frontiers people, the Frontiersmen, they, um, you know, the, uh, the interchangeable cartridge idea, the 4440s and things like that. Um, do you think that's still a valuable concept or do you say stick with the rifle calibers and the rifles and the, the handgun calibers and the handguns? Well, I don't want to make anybody mad. <laughs> uh, the idea of interchangeability between your pistol and your rifle slash carbine is nostalgic. Going back to the idea of I'm on a horse and how much can I carry with me? Yep. I could be on the trail for days or weeks before I saw another person or had a chance for any kind of resupply at a mercantile or uh, anything else store. Yeah. And then range, how far do you think you have to shoot at somebody before they're not a threat? Okay. Uh, pistol caliber carbine, like you said, the 4440, decent 100 yard range, maybe a little bit more. And then you have to think about the skill of the user. Exactly. Uh, we talk about professional shooters today and the skill they have, but average people, normals, right? Uh, 
we're talking about maybe being able to hold on a 12 inch circle at 50 yards and heat that with reliability. Uh, that's what everybody wants. And that's what everybody needed. Uh, modern day ballistics. Uh, we live in the golden age of bullet design, firearms design, everything else. Uh, and we're spoiled, horribly spoiled. It's <laughs> like, how come this gun only shoots three quarters of an inch at a hundred yards? I'm, <laughs> I'm flabbergasted and I demand my money back. It's yeah. that, that kind of attitude. Yeah. No, uh, this, we're, we're seeing magic in technology and we accept that as, well, it's everywhere. Yeah. It wasn't everywhere uh, 150 years ago. Yeah. We have the benefit of a good supply chain in this country currently. We'll see how long that lasts. But the, uh, the idea of having spe- separate rifle cartridges not compatible with your revolver or pistol, it's, it's, a, it's, it's really a non-question. Uh, you know, failure to have enough on hand for yourself in times of trials, uh, well, that's on you. Yeah. Let's take a, uh, a turn, even though this is a topic we could you know, spend the rest of the day talking about. The other thing that you're noted for here at, at Gunsight is church security. And we've, uh, you know, we've talked about it before. It's uh, of huge interest to our audience. Uh, how did that all get started to begin with? Uh, how did the course come to be in existence here at Gunsight? Uh, every couple of years, Gunsight holds a Range Masters Conference and uh, staff instructors uh, gather up in the big classroom and we hash out uh, perceived difficulties with either doctrine or, you know, uh, the way things are written in the handbook or, you know, future ideas for new classes or modifications to existing classes. And I hear they can be quite spirited. Of course they can. (laughs) You have, you put a room full of uh, alpha type people into a closed box and that's a lot of energy with no place to go, and there's no wrestling mats. Or yeah. uh, so the uh, uh, the idea of church defense was not my idea. Uh, it was it was from administrative staff because of uh, inquiries from uh, outside entities ah. asking for it, and I simply stepped forward. And actually, I was pushed, or everybody else <laughs> stepped back. I'm not sure exactly how it worked out, but we're behind you all the way. Uh, I like. Uh, I don't like the idea of a bully or a maniac or uh, a psychotic getting into a group of people that are minding their own business, uh, enjoying their faith and practicing what the Constitution says is a God-given right and uh, doing mayhem. So the idea of how to mitigate that and either by prevention or intervention doesn't really matter, uh, but putting barriers between that kind of a uh, person that would do murder in a church, house of worship, you fill in the blank of what you want to call it, and training that would re- be required to get people to understand, first, that it can happen. It doesn't matter that the news says it happens all the time. One, it doesn't actually happen all the time, just like lightning doesn't kill everybody on the planet. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but it happens often enough that it is a concern, and it's a respectable concern, you know, yeah. just like... Uh, you know, auto accidents, you know, Mm -hmm. they're going to happen, plan for it. Exactly. uh, What I did was the research, looked at trends, uh, looked at the historical trends, uh, wasn't exactly reinventing the wheel. Other countries have programs in place, uh, security protocols for structures, events. We have them here. Okay. Mm -hmm. When you go to a ball game today, you go through a metal detector, you are looked at by security staff who are like, is that person under the influence? Is that person under the influence of alcohol? Does that person look like they're hiding something? We're used to it. Yeah. Churches are not used to that. Yeah. Okay? They are welcoming. That's, their, that's the whole point. Uh, everyone is welcome. We want to serve you as fill in the blank of whatever the faith is, you know, uh, dictates. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, my job is not to undo any of that. It is simply uh, been to really, uh, we don't, in fact, Gunsight does not give out a list of things. These are the best things. We have students come in and we give them a list of topics mm-hmm. and say, how would you fix this? Yeah. And we have the students in a group that's really team problem solving. They share their own experiences of events that have happened with their congregations. And then that starts up the next person talking about, oh, well, that's happened to me too. Oh, that happened to my friend. And pretty soon you have a snowball turning into an avalanche of yeah. information. And that shared information 
takes all the work off of what I have to do. And then it really solves itself. And the solutions that people find for their own individual uh, buildings, places of worship, uh, regional areas, uh, when they write down how to solve those things, their buy-in is much greater than if they've hired some contract person to come in and say, hey, here's what you need to do. The camera's over here and the guy over here and check this door and close this one. They're like, nobody likes that. Yeah. They like solving their own problems. Everybody does. Mm -hmm. And when you build your own project and you have that investment, you take much better care of it. Just like a car. Yeah. If somebody gives you a car. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the car. Yeah. But if you have to spend your own money and sweat on that car, you take much better care of it. Exactly. Same thing. And I've been asked many times by folks I know that go to different churches, hey, we want to put a team together. You know, how many gunfighters do we need? And we always try to say, you know, slow down their speed racer. There's a lot more to this. How do you approach that? Because do you think folks are coming to gun site thinking we're just going to be putting all kinds of lead down range and we'll be trained in that aspect of it? And obviously they will be, but there is so much more to putting a safety security team together than just load and, you know, make ready. We talk about a lot about the characteristics that you're looking for in an individual and uh, male or female doesn't matter. Mm hmm. Uh, background can matter, okay? Uh, certain, certain fields of endeavor bring skill sets in that are sometimes very useful from a security standpoint, right? Mm -hmm. When you want, hey, uh, if we're going to have to put hands on somebody, okay, do we want a kindergarten teacher for that? Maybe. If they're, you know, they could be a crab maga master, you don't know. Yeah. But, or do we want somebody that's been 15 years in the Marine Corps and had you know, just got out, of the, got out of the academy two years ago and wants to help out on your security team. Right. So those skill sets, you can save a lot of money on uh, from a, you know, when you're, because you're talking about people that are going to be volunteers. Right. And again, uh, people that are volunteering have more skin in the game than people that are being paid to do the work. But uh, those skill sets, uh, medical, uh, EMTs, uh, counseling, you know, you, you have you have assets that if you if you have to if you think about it for a moment that are extremely valuable. And I mean, either from a monetary standpoint or just an experience standpoint or both. Yeah. You know, it, you touched on it's hard to reconcile uh, a house of worship is opening is open, welcoming and they want everybody. You know, they uh you know, the Judeo-Christian teachings, the least of us, you know, needs to come in and, and be part of this. But yet from a security standpoint, you know, there's there's this idea that there may be some folks we don't want here. And um, how do you reconcile that? How do your students reconcile that with church leadership? Because they're coming from a different stand, a different outlook than folks that understand there are not good people in the world that may want to create harm. So how, how, how does that come together and, and happen? Well, it's, uh, you know, it's an interesting question because you have uh, two sides. The one is uh, thou shalt not kill, right? Okay, well, we're not really concerned about that. We're concerned with stopping uh, a murderous event, okay? Mass killing is the goal. Uh, the people that pull these off, either for political reasons or... Uh, religious reasons or just for body counts for self-aggrandizement, mm -hmm. uh, you can't do anything about that. What you can do is put barriers in place and make yourself a more difficult target. If you, uh, we, we call it, we call, Gunsay calls it church defense, the class, because we had to call it something. And people know what a church is. Uh, we could have called it anything. We could have called it religious building defense or yeah. something. Uh, they may do that in the future. I don't know. But if you look at Things like uh, the mosque attack at Christchurch, New Zealand, as an example, as horrific as it was, the political results following that were far more tragic. Yeah. Just, I mean, not compared to the loss of life, but the loss of life that will ensue after this because of the loss of individual rights in that country. The repercussions are going to be for a century, yeah. at least. Then uh, in our own country, United States, we have a media-driven frenzy when these attacks occur, horrible, 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 horrible. Yeah. Unless 
the attack is stopped by somebody who's capable of stopping it. And then that horrible story, whoops, yep. it disappears off the radar screen really fast. Because it doesn't fit the narrative. It doesn't fit the narrative, right? So uh, I would rather not fit the narrative, okay, and succeed that way than to fit the narrative and have a big tragedy. Yeah. You know, I was just sitting here as we're talking, and the the last really big one, you know, event in a church was many months ago. It was, uh, I believe, Jack Wilson, uh, the situation in Texas yep. that everybody saw on videotape. That was back in January or maybe December. I can't remember. December 16th. Yeah. And obviously you follow this a lot closer than I do, but I can't remember seeing anything since then. Do you think maybe there's a little bit of a chilling effect that uh, some of these uh, people that might do this are suddenly starting to realize that maybe it's not a soft target anymore? Or do you just think we're just we've just hit a lull and we're lucky? Well, you can come up with a conjecture that uh, because it's media driven and the media is in love right now with uh, <laughs> other events yeah. and civil disruptions, uh, it just doesn't get the press. Uh, problem with no no news, no bad news is it doesn't sell, right? right. So, uh, but that made a big splash when uh, you had, you know, the killer still killed two people, and he killed two armed people. Mm -hmm. And so, from a, from a training standpoint, you can say, well, we couldn't see that coming, but from a training standpoint, yes. We can't see that coming. We talk about things like equipment and ready access and the 1.5 second draw and being able to beat the drop and how to step offline or how to go hands on if you have close contact. Uh, all these things, you know, if you don't train it, yeah, then you don't know it. OK, so that's part of our, 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 our curriculum as well. Any any uh, stories you can share or want to share about maybe graduates of the class or anything that interesting happened in the class? Well, one, one of the things that is ha one thing that happened uh, is that we do force on force. Right. OK, so we're using uh, paintball, paint marking cartridges out of real shootable handguns. And you're facing a lethal threat, manufactured lethal threat right. in a scenario that's very closely written. A lot of people... I mean, you and I have been in law enforcement all of our adult lives, and we've done and seen a lot of things. Not your average, your average go to the office, teach at school, uh, run a market person has not seen or done those things, not on a television screen. When they have it in front of them, wow, you mean it happens that fast? Yes, that's how fast it happens. You're talking, it's over in three seconds. Yeah. So I've come a thousand miles, trained for 40 hours, and if I'm not able to solve this problem in three seconds, that's what you're telling me? Yep, that's what I'm telling you. Holy cow. <laughs> that eye-opening experience and the takeaway that we get in the evaluations, we hear that a lot. Like, really? thank you. I, I had no idea. I yeah. had no idea that that's how fast things happen. Yeah. Yep. So. Is your average student that's coming into this class, are they prior military, prior law enforcement, or is it mostly non? Or, I mean, what's your quote unquote typical student look like? Typical student uh, falls between 40 and 65 years of age, uh, predominantly male, about 5% female. The uh, backgrounds vary from professionals, doctor, lawyer, uh, school teacher, uh, truck driver. Uh, to everything else. Yeah. Uh, probably about 50% are retired or semi-retired and have the time and means to be volunteers in their, in their places of worship. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been there at the places of worship at least five years and have investments either in family or friends. And so their stakes that they're betting on are well, I want to take care of this. Yeah. Uh, I know bad. I know it's a, you know, the world has always been a dangerous place. It will always be a dangerous place. And failure to, you know, to take reasonable steps to protect just makes you seem reckless. Yeah. Yeah. So what advice would you give as you are, quote unquote, an expert in this subject? What advice do you give when somebody tells you, hey, I heard you do this class. We want to start a team. What should we do? Well, you have assets available locally, every state and county. Uh, of this country. 
So, and they're called the sheriff's department for your local police department. And they have contact officers for this very types of program. Mm -hmm. Uh, Big push 20 years ago after Columbine, Colorado was active shooter intervention, immediate intervention. The, uh, from a school defense standpoint, this is just uh, basically a carry on with that same principle of immediate intervention. Yep. Uh, when you have an active murderer inside a crowd of people, there's only one way to deal with that, and that is to go straight at them. If they've gotten past all of your previous security screening, well, now it's on. Yeah. And like in uh, White Settlement, Texas, when Jack Wilson made that shot from at least 15 yards, uh, Jack Wilson is your typical American uh, enthusiast shooter. Mm -hmm. Okay. He's a hobbyist and a dedicated target uh, shooter. But he had a very deep emotional and loving investment in that church. Yeah. That's where his friends are. That's where he's worshipped for years. And that kind of dedication, huge asset. You know, everybody always focuses on the active shooter. And that's obviously something that we we should focus on because the uh, the results are so horrific. But uh, truly, and talking to friends and family members who are on church security teams, regular crime intrudes too, into church. And, and that's really probably what uh, folks are going to see more. So you guys talk about that a lot. We do. It's, uh, you know, it, it, it's a misnomer, but we call it regular crime. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So regular crime. What is that? Uh, theft, uh, burglary, uh, physical assault, simple assault. Okay. You, you mentioned domestic violence. Uh, domestic violence is number one killer in law enforcement, mm -hmm. for police officers, the most dangerous call you can go on. It's the most dangerous call you can go on in the church because the counseling very often is bringing people that are involved with domestic violence in their own personal relationships, and they're seeking counseling at places of religious worship, and the spillover can be extremely dangerous. Yeah. Uh, the sex crimes, okay, crimes against children, uh, abuse, simple abuse, uh, child abuse, uh, being able to recognize those kinds of crimes or the, the, the symptoms or evidence of those crimes. Uh, we talk about reporting, okay? We talk about, it, you know, it doesn't matter how minor the offense is. We talk about, uh, for, for instance, you say uh, your brother, a side conversation we had uh, a while ago. Your brother's on a church security team, and he dealt with this guy who was acting strangely. What do we do about that guy? Well, I tell you what you do about that guy. If you can't identify him, you report the incident to your local authorities mm -hmm. and generate a number to go with that report. And if it occurs again, you have a record and a history of the event. Yeah. That's how you build a case. And that's how you build an intervention for somebody that needs either mental help or a criminal investigation type of intervention uh, if there is a crime. It's a big hurdle to get over with religious organizations yeah. to report crimes, all right? We have, a uh, not, not, not from my standpoint, but, uh, working in law enforcement, I'm, I'm all about reporting crimes and putting people in jail that deserve it. Yep. Uh, that's why they built them, <laughs> because they deserved it. Yeah. So uh, from uh, church defense, you have administrators, church leaders, uh, religious leaders saying, you know what? You know, let's say our, myth our mythical person, Fred, he's, that's just how Fred is. Okay. Fred's a little strange. Uh, yeah. You know, he's staring at the kids on the, on the playground, but that's just how he is. Yeah. He, he's just that way. He's just that way. Yeah. Now, uh, Fred needs to be t looked at and either a restraining order put against him. So he's not looking at kids on the playground or a more serious intervention. Yeah. Okay. So if you want to prevent crime, you have to act like crime is serious. And that means every crime from a petty theft to uh, an inappropriate touching to you name it, that's what the police are there for. That's what your sheriff's department is there for. They're not getting paid to not report crimes. Right. They are paid to investigate crimes and to stop them. 
And we sell that a lot. There's much more acceptance now of having church security, whereas even, say, 10 years ago, people were like, oh, come on, really? Uh, bad things occasionally happen. But I think now uh, the majority of the world has kind of got the memo. Do you see more acceptance uh, for these kind of teams? Well, absolutely. I mean, but you still have uh, you're always going to have the political division between, you know, blues and reds, right? Yeah. Blue state, red states. And then you have uh, the head in the sand philosophy of, you know, it's never happened here. No never going to happen. Never here. reason, no reason to think it's ever going to happen here. Yep. It's always going to happen. Okay. Uh, you know, Dillinger said he robbed banks because that's where they kept the money. Yeah. Uh, people go into churches because they think they're going to be soft targets. Mm -hmm. When the idea gets to be that they're not going to be soft targets, then they're not going to do it. Well, if I may borrow a phrase, amen. Yep. <laughs> well, Lou, it's been great talking to you. A lot of great information. And folks can, how can they get more information about Gunsight? Well, Gunsight's on the web. Uh, you put in that word, G-U-N-S-I-T-E, Academy, and a lot of information right there. Exactly. Well, uh, again, thanks. And I'm looking forward. We'll do some training later this week. Thank you. I hope you picked up some good information from Lou Gosnell, whether you're a cowboy action shooter or serving your house of worship as a security team member. And with that, we hope you're enjoying the Guns Magazine podcast. Please tell all your friends, even those crazy riding liberals. Guns Magazine is number one in the business, and we're using our decades of friendships to bring you the most interesting chats in the gun world. If you have questions, comments, or a guest you'd like to recommend for the show, please email me. That's editor at gunsmagazine.com. Make sure you don't miss out on anything by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast directory and YouTube. And of course, you can always listen and download our episodes at gunsmagazine.com. While you're at it, don't forget to check out our sister publication, American Handgunner Magazine, at AmericanHandgunner.com. Even better, it's not a bad idea to support firearms journalism by subscribing to one or both of our print magazines. And finally, I'd like to remind you to check out our sponsor and friend, Kimber Firearms at KimberAmerica.com. That's it for this episode of the Guns Magazine podcast for the entire staff at FMG Publications. I'm Guns Magazine editor Brent Wheat. Now get out there and get shooting. Get shooting.